Caesar Augustus had initiated a decree for a census to be taken, and Joseph and Mary and their unborn child began their journey. They landed in a small town called Bethlehem from the house and the family of David. The time had come for Mary to deliver, but there was no room in the inn, and so Mary gave birth to her first healthy baby boy, and she wrapped him in cloth and laid him in a manger, a feeding trough for horses and donkeys and cattle. It was a prophetic word unfolding in the most unlikely circumstances. The message had first delivered by a terrifying angel to Mary and Joseph. This is Luke 1, starting in verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And then to Joseph in Matthew 1, starting in verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she'll bear a son. 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So the message was true, and everything that had been told to them was becoming a reality. Maybe not how they thought it would happen, but it was still happening. Jesus had been born, God, Emmanuel, God with us. The message was spoken, now lying in a manger in Bethlehem. The message that was spoken proclaimed among common men, individuals like you and I. I mean, how could the most important message in all of human history be announced to some of the most unimportant people of society? And it's not just their story, it's our story too. Like, we don't come from a royal line of kings and queens. We're not, not many of us come from money or power. It seems like the most insignificant people... And the community at times, it just feels that way. I, I mean, if, if it seems like people just overlook you, then it would make sense that the holy God of the universe would likewise overlook you too. And that's the remarkable narrative of the Christmas story, and specifically the gospel. The greatest news was first announced to unimportant men in the field. Not because they're amazing. No, because we serve an amazing God that passes over the proud and the arrogant and lands in the fields outside of Jerusalem. We serve an amazing God that in his good grace offers good news to men and women that feel like no one else in the world really cares about them. It's the Christmas story told to shepherds. It's the Christmas story sung by the heavenly angels. And so we'll be in Luke 2. This morning, if you have a digital Bible, I'll be reading out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, uh, all of the main passages on the back of your bulletin. Uh, everything else should be on this. Uh, Luke 2, I'm going to start in verse 8, and we'll read together. Verse 8 says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then the angel appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... Suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And then when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Well, then let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and, and praising God for all they had heard and seen as had been told to them. At the end of the eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. <clears throat> Jesus, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of the world, Light of the world, God in the flesh, in his birth is first announced to who? I heard Emily. Sh shepherds. <laughs> shepherds. Verse 8, shepherds out in the field doing their job at night, a message that would change the course of the world given to shepherds. Who are the shepherds? They're hardworking men. Men guarding the precious commodity of their region, lambs sold to the temple for sacrifice, sheep sold for meat and milk and fat and wool and skins and horns. And they braved cold and sleepless nights. They weathered storms. They fought off animals that might take out the flock. They watched and listened and counted. They're not important men, but they do have important jobs. So why, I mean, why the shepherds? 
I mean, why, why would the birth of Jesus first be told to some ordinary guys in the field? Why not tell the news to the religious leaders at the temple just like five miles down the road? Why not tell the Jewish leaders that have memorized the Torah and were waiting for a Messiah? It is very likely that these shepherds were raising lambs to be slaughtered for the sacrifice at the Jewish temple. Being in such close proximity to the temple, it's very likely that this was, or at least part of their job. So why deliver the message to the shepherds? Let me give you a few options here. First one, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And so when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to be baptized, he shouts out this reality in John 1, 29. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it would be fitting that the message of the birth of the one true and final Lamb of God would be first shared with those raising lambs in the field for the sacrifice. It is a message that God is initiating the Old Testament sacrificial system. It is a message that God will provide the perfect sacrifice once and for all, that Jesus will take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And I don't think the shepherds understood it at that depth, but we can this morning. Why the shepherds? Well, Jesus, he's the good shepherd. God used this unique illustration of how he will provide for his people through his son Jesus. This is, again, John 10, 11, Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so it would be fitting for the message of the birth of his birth would first be given to show how that illustration will operate. If you believe and have faith in the Son of God, Jesus is your good shepherd. He cares for you. He loves you. He laid down his life for you. He will keep you from the death of sin. Jesus is not an okay shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And God chose to deliver this news to the shepherds to help illustrate this very point. Why the shepherds? Well, the message is for all people. I mean, the very act of first delivering the news to the shepherds is to show how God operates. The message of hope was delivered to a bunch of guys. Think about this. A bunch of guys that weren't even allowed into the temple. By Levitical law, the shepherds would have been unclean. God's plan of salvation was first delivered to ordinary men to show that God's plan of salvation, well, that's for all people. And it does not matter if you have a lot of money this morning, or if you have a big house, or the importance of your position at work. It doesn't matter if your past is clean or it's wrecked with dysfunction. It does not matter if you have it all together or if you don't. What matters is the message of Christmas is for all people. I mean, it's for the rich and the poor. It's for the together and the broken. It's for the people that realize they need a hope that is beyond themselves. So the message delivered to the shepherds is for all people. It is a Christmas message. A Christmas message that says, you you may not be clean enough to get into the temple, but I'll make you clean and I'll make your body the temple because I'm a good shepherd. The message is for all people. It is the hope of a savior. Luke 10, 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father of Lord, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. The hope of a Savior. And so all is calm in the field. And it's dark, and it's quiet, and the shepherds, well, they're on high alert. They see the shifting shadows as they scan the field. They hear every rustling noise in the distance. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord stands in front of them. He's not floating above them with wings. He is standing in their presence. And everything that was dark was now bright around them. And the glory of the Lord shines around these men. And the angel of the Lord has come to deliver a message. It is the song of the angels that cause us to sing. And it is their proclamation that stirs a song of praise for the children of God. And so we've been answering this question every week of this series, why do we sing? Why do we sing? This is the third one, the first week. 
was the song of Mary, and all of these points build off each other. So why do we sing song of Mary? The Lord looks upon the humble. The Lord shows mercy to the lowly. Last week was the song of Zechariah. So point three, the Lord keeps his promises. Number four, the Lord offers forgiveness of sins. And this week, the song of angels. Why do we sing? What will the angels proclaim in Luke 2 that will cause us to sing? So here's point five in your notes. The Lord has been born. The Lord has been born. Verse 10, the angel, whose name is not specified this time, said to the shepherds in the field, Fear not, for I behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be for all people. It's this pattern that we see throughout Luke 1 and 2 of an angel proclamation. So we have the fear not. The presence of the angels is consistently terrifying throughout the scriptures. They're not childlike, simple, and sweet creatures. Angels are often unnoticed, but sometimes revealed in the form of a man. Regardless, the evidence that we see in verse 8 is that this angel is surrounded by the glory of the Lord. That is a terrifying presence of the angel. Because it's the overwhelming presence of the glory of the Lord. So it's understandable that these shepherds are fearful. Fear not. Why? Well, when we have a fear not, we also have a message from the angel. Because the message from the Lord is not one of doom and gloom. It is the one of joy and hope. And can we just breathe a little on that one? I mean, I'm so... I'm so sick of bad news. Thursday morning, I, I woke up and I grabbed a cup of coffee. And like most mornings, I clicked on uh, the Google News app uh, on my phone. And the first article I see is that five children fell to their death when a gust of wind threw a bouncy castle uh, in the air as the school is just trying to celebrate before Christmas break. And honestly, like, I couldn't even read the entire story. It was just too tragic. It was too much bad news to even process. I'm so sick of bad news. And it's not like sad and dark things haven't been present since the beginning, but today it just feels like we are hearing it proclaimed to us in every waking moment through the means of invasive technology. I'm so sick of bad news. So we can breathe a little on verse 10. This is good news. Not only that, is it of great joy. Not only that, it is for all people, which we will study next week. The angel has come to tell us this morning good news. Good news from the Greek word euangelion, translated gospel. So this specific use of a verb is found 11 times in the gospels. And 10 of those times, it's found in the gospel of Luke. Meaning this is not just good news of some sort of temporary measure. No, friends, this is a proclamation of the gospel to shepherds in the field. It's not a message of good news of temporary happiness, but of lasting joy. R.C. Sproul, this might be a little long, but he framed it like this. The gospel is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings. And that problem is simply this. God is holy, and he is just, and I am not. And at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before a just and holy God, and I will be judged. And I'll be judged either on the basis of my own righteousness, or lack of it, or the righteousness of another. So the good news of the gospel is that Jesus lived a life of perfect righteousness, of perfect obedience to God, not for his own well-being, but for his people. And he has done for me what I couldn't possibly do for myself. But not only has he lived that life of perfect obedience, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the justice and the righteousness of God. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news shared to the marginalized in society. That's the good news shared with us this morning. And that good news starts and ends with a person named Jesus. Verse 11 of the text is the prophecy of Isaiah 9 being fulfilled. The gospel has been born. 
Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child has been born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Christ child has been born in the city of David. He is Savior, not Savior of some sort of political party. Not savior of a temporary nation, not savior of some sort of woke theology, not savior of some sort of liberal or conservative ideology. No, that's not why Christ was born. That's not what the angel told Joseph. Matthew 121, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Christ, the anointed chosen one, Lord, the one who has given all authority and rule. Christ, the Lord, being born means the gospel was born. That's why we need this Christmas. That's why we sing that. That's why we sing the Lord has been born, Lord over every nation, Lord over every ruler, Lord over every person here or that will ever listen to this message. And so how foolish we are to fill our schedules with so many things, whether it's sports or church activities or events or programs. And I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about myself as well. Like how foolish I am as a preacher to say yes to so many things in December that I can't even stop and notice why I'm doing the things I'm doing. Like, sure, we gladly say, Jesus is the reason for the season. Or we proudly say, we don't say happy holidays. We still say Merry Christmas. But God forgive us for rejecting pagan Christian or pagan culture and then replacing it with just more pagan Christian culture. This Christmas season, you and I don't need more. We don't need more on our plates. We don't need more stuff. We need to rest in the presence of Christ the Lord. The Lord's been born. The gospel has been born. Emmanuel, God with us. It is a reminder that the hope of the gospel was born, and that should be uh, rising in our hearts and our minds this morning. Not a restless anxiety, like just waiting for the holidays to pass. So God, forgive us. We don't sing to Christ the Lord like we should because we don't rest in Christ the Lord like we should. Hope has visited and redeemed you want proof? You want to know how I'm not making this up? Verse 12, well, the angel said, well, I'll give you a sign. I mean, you didn't ask for it, but I'll prove it. And you will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And the shepherds didn't even have time to process what they heard. Verse 13, suddenly... There is with one angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. And that scene never leaves me because it's a scene that seems like it should be on display among crowds. It's a scene that seems like it should be like a special ceremony among the religious elite in the temple. And yet a proclamation and a heavenly Christmas cantata begins in the fields to lowly shepherds and not like the Christmas cantata at your grandmother's church where they play music on that tape player in the back and then uh, like a church lady that sings a little song, a song just a little too loud and she's out of key. No, this isn't some weird scene from a church program that you wish to escape. This is a heavenly choir in the dark fields near Jerusalem and the bright lights of the glory of the Lord and the song of a multitude of the heavenly hosts, verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among whom those whom he he is pleased. Why do we sing? Here's point six. The Lord brings peace to his children. The Lord brings peace to his children. The angel army begins to worship in the field and they sing glory to God in the highest. It's the same kind of praise from Psalm 148, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. It's the same kind of praise the crowd would shout to Christ just a few days before they shout crucify. Luke 19, 38. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's just do a quick survey here uh, this morning. 
And don't give me a churchy uh, response because you'll ruin the point. I'm just be honest. When you look at your life right now and all of the chaos that's happening around you, would you raise your hand if this sentence describes you? I am not at perfect peace with the way my life is going right now. Okay. As a preacher, I hear lots of things from different people during the week. Um, I rarely hear, you know, um, life's really peaceful right now, Jason. Just thought you should know. Have a great day. Um, it's just not true of us. I mean, how can we have peace when we've got drama in our family and among our friend groups? How, how can we have peace when we have bills uh, to pay and we're just struggling to afford them? How can we have peace when we're battling sickness that has lasted longer than we could have ever dreamed? How can we have peace when there's so much chaos that's inside of us and chaos around us? The answer is found in why the angels are singing to begin with. The angels don't sing because Christ has come to fix your temporary problems. The angels sing because Christ came to pay for your eternal problem. And you may not believe me when I say this, but it's true. The problem with your life and my life is not that you are not at peace with yourself and those around you. That's not your problem. The problem with your life is that you are not at peace with the Holy God. And until uh, Christ takes care of the hostility between you and God, you will never find a lasting peace. I promise you that. So what's the point of feeling good about your life, but having the wrath of God pointed at you? So listen, this is not an earthly peace. It is a heavenly peace that has arrived on earth. It is a peace that only the gospel can provide. Acts 10.36 And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And it's about that time of December where my wife and I begin to wrap presents uh, of her friends and family. And when I say my wife and I, I really just mean my wife does all that. Um... But it never fails. Like during Christmas, um, during December, every single year, one or all of our children will see a wrapped present on the counter and under the Christmas tree and just immediately lose their minds. And obviously, they're not excited that the present is for someone else. They are excited because they think that present is for them. And so they squeal and they run around the house asking us if those are their presents. And uh, to be honest, I always judged parents for having selfish children around the Christmas tree until we had our own selfish children. And we don't want them to be that way. We do our best to teach them that Christmas is about Jesus and being with family and not about gifts. But it just never fails. Never fails. They see a wrapped gift and they think it's for them. And so we have to calmly tell them the truth. We have to break it to them that this gift is not for them, but it's for someone else. Let me calmly break the news to you. And to be honest, you might not have heard this much around the Christmas story. The gift of peace sung by the angels is not for everyone. Sure. The message is for all people. But the gift of peace is only for those that have been reconciled with God through faith in Christ alone. And so if you have not submitted your life to Christ the Lord, if you've not repented and believed and been baptized into Christ, the gift's not for you, friend. The Lord is not pleased with those that are not His. And everyone, for sure, is made in the image of God, but not everyone is a child of God. And the NIV translates Luke ten fourteen this way, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those with, on whom His favor rests. 
So to be clear, God's favor does not rest on you without Christ. And without Christ, there's no lasting peace to even sing about. So the shepherds quickly went and found Mary and Joseph and the Christ child. What the angel said was true. Salvation has arrived. Peace is offered to his children. And in verse 20, it says that the shepherds left singing, singing praises to the Lord because of what the angel sang. So this Christmas, my question is, will you sing with the angels and the shepherds? The Lord's been born. And the Lord brings eternal and lasting peace to his children. That's the first Noel, the angel did say. With certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields as they lay, keeping their sheep, and on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the king of Israel. If you have any questions about this message, I'd love to talk with you after the service, but let's pray and then we'll uh, sing together.